Of course, he was upset about that, and I wanted him to be because I wanted him to feel what I had felt with a guy that I'd gone to school with. And one of the things that I had done is said, cut that relationship off. And the day that the trial began, that if I would have taken a plea, I would have avoided the death penalty. While the person who actually committed the crime got a life sentence. That's just, no, that's not right. That's foolish because I wasn't gonna, I didn't accept the plea because I wasn't gonna sign my life away for something I didn't. Well, I don't think Ryan shot at all. You don't think he fired a no, shot? Not at all. And I go and throw there. And he said, well, take a look at it and what do you think? We, we were just gonna have to do it. You, why not? You know, what did you have to lose? 12 years was a long time for a, you know, a 22, 23 year old bloke. 13 eyewitnesses all testify that, you know, Ryan caused the the shot. It's Charles' life. Did you do anything wrong? Absolutely not. In February 2009, Heather Strong was kidnapped and slaughtered in Marion County, Florida. Her slayer, Amelia Lily Carr, was found guilty in December 2010 and sentenced to her end by lethal injection in February 2011. Who was Amelia Carr and why did she commit this heinous act? Amelia Carr's life. Amelia Carr was born Amelia Yera, the second of three sisters. A psychologist estimated her IQ to be 125. At the age of 15, she reported misuse by her father to her school, but withdrew her statement to officials. In February 2004, Carr's father was convicted of attempting to solicit the slayings of his family and was sentenced to four years in prison. Carr had been married twice and filed a restraining order against one of her ex-husbands for domestic violence. She was sentenced to two years of probation for her involvement in her ex-husband's grand theft of exotic birds. Carr had three children at the time, one of them with ex-boyfriend Jamie Acomb. In November 2008, Carr became engaged to Joshua Damien Fulham, who instead married Heather Strong one month later. However, Carr maintained contact with him and babysat Strong's two children, according to Carr's family. In January 2009, Fulham was arrested for threatening Strong with a shotgun, but was released after the charge of aggravated charge with a firearm was dropped. Investigators later discovered that Carr had threatened Strong with a knife to force her to withdraw her criminal complaint. Carr and Fulham re-established their relationship while Strong began seeing someone else. Fulham and Strong became involved in a legal battle over the custody of their two children. The story behind the crime. In February 2009, Heather Strong, then a 26-year-old resident of Citra, Florida, disappeared while employed at an iron skillet restaurant at a Petro gas station next to Interstate Route 75 in Reddick. She was reported missing on February 15. Her remains were discovered on March 19 in a shallow grave by a storage trailer in Boardman near McIntosh, Florida. Carr was arrested after investigators noted the frequency of her statements to authorities, 10 in all without the presence of an attorney. Detectives also recorded undercover audio of Carr discussing details of the crime with Fulham's sister. Carr, who at the time was seven months pregnant with Fulham's child, tricked Strong into the storage trailer behind the home of Carr's mother, Maria, and placed a plastic bag over her head after unsuccessfully trying to break her neck. Strong eventually perished of asphyxiation while bound by duct tape to a computer chair. Strong's estranged husband, Joshua Fulham, was arrested on suspicion of fraud for using her credit cards after she had disappeared. Carr wasn't arrested in the case until March 24, 2009, managing to elude arrest for almost a week as she negotiated and engaged in verbal gymnastics with sheriff's detectives Donald Buey and Brian Spivey, seeking to distance herself from the gruesome crime. Although Strong and Fulham were longtime friends, they had two children together but married as recently as December 2009. It was Fulham and Carr who were romantically involved at the time of Heather's death. In fact, Carr was seven months pregnant with Fulham's child at the time. Whatever their commitment to one another, King told jurors that Carr had told detectives it was Fulham who allegedly threatened to do the same to her that he said he had done to his estranged wife, strangle her, then bury her body. Later, after Strong's body was unearthed, said the prosecutor, Carr requested a private meeting with Fulham's sister in which she revealed the manner in which Strong was slain, suffocated with a bag over her head after Carr tried and failed to break her neck. That conversation, unbeknownst to Carr, was recorded by law enforcement. 
In a sign that this trial could hinge on jurors' interpretation of Carr's videotaped confessions, her defense attorney cautioned the jury in her opening statement to be mindful of Carr's stress levels when she provided her statements. Saying Carr was as much of a victim as Heather, Candace Hawthorne reminded the jury that Carr was undergoing a high-risk pregnancy when questioned and that her three other children had recently been removed from her custody. Are they out there to do justice or are they out there to win? And in Amelia's case, they were out to win. Law enforcement is very crafty and they're out there to win. She believed that her love and her heart and her honesty would bear out. Because of her emotional state and physical state, being pregnant, the hormones, they play all sorts of tricks on your head. She was an innocent that was manipulated by law enforcement into giving a false confession. Tossing the blame and intent back onto Fulham, who remains in custody at the jail as he awaits his own trial on the same charges, Hawthorne cast him as a jealous and possessive man who wanted strong, who was tied to other men, all to himself. We had a lot of similar passions. She wanted to be a teacher. You know, I became a massage therapist. Just me and Heather had a lot of similarities in our past. Um, because at the end of the day, there was no animosity. We would hang out, just girl talk. We both had that maternal love, and we both always tried to do what was best for our kids. Later in March 2009, Carr gave birth to her fourth child while in custody at Marion County Jail. All of her children were placed in foster care. Carr provided a confession to investigators, but claimed that she had only done so in the hope of being reunited with her children. Uh, they befriend you, they just want to clear this up, they want to clear your name, and nothing can be further from the truth. The police are not on your side, and they are trained in interrogation techniques. She was very conniving. She was very good at manipulating people. She's, I think, truly what you would call a sociopath. Trials of Emilia Carr and Joshua Fulham. Emilia Carr and Joshua Fulham waived their right to a speedy trial during their arraignment for slaying in April 2009. Prosecutor Rock Hooker immediately filed a notice of his intent to pursue the death penalty because of the heinous nature of the crime. There was no physical evidence linking her to the crime, but in this case, none may have been necessary. In a conversation captured clearly on tape, Emilia Carr confesses to assisting with the brutal crime. An hour-long tape was played back for jurors during Carr's first-degree slaying and kidnapping trial. It was one of many recorded conversations prosecutors played for the panel, and this one was thought to be the most convincing one of all. At the time of the conversation, the women were sitting beside each other in a car. Yeah, she fought him, Carr responded. Did you help? Gustafson continued. Yeah, I helped, Carr said softly. The echoes of Carr's vivid and confessionary words to Gustafson, a friend of hers, seemed to linger in the courtroom and were likely one of the most damaging pieces of evidence against her. In November 2009, State Circuit Judge Willard Pope declined Emilia Carr's request for a continuance of the trial because of her concerns over the preparedness of defense attorney Candace Hawthorne. A jury found Carr guilty of first-degree slaying and kidnapping after two and a half hours of deliberations on December 7, 2010. During the penalty phase of the trial, Carr's family testified on her behalf that she had been traumatized since her early childhood by physical exploitation by her father and grandfather. However, the jury voted 7-5 to five on December 10 in favor of the fatal penalty for Carr. She was formally sentenced to her end by lethal injection on February 22, 2011. More than a year after Carr's conviction for the slaying of Heather Strong, her co-defendant, Joshua Fulham, went on trial for his alleged participation in the slaying in April 2012. Carr, on the row at the Lowell Correctional Institute Annex, would not testify at the trial. The prosecution detailed the gruesome aspects of the crime. Both the prosecution and Fulham's defense attorneys agreed that the motives for Heather Strong's slaying were jealousy and betrayal. At the conclusion of his trial, Fulham was convicted of first-degree slaying and kidnapping. Despite the fatal sentence of his co-defendant, Joshua's jury voted 8-4 to four to sentence him to life in prison without parole, and the judge followed the jury's recommendation. Carr was placed in the annex at Lowell Correctional Institution in Marion County on February 23, 2011. She was one of four women on the row in Florida, the other three being Tiffany Cole, Margaret Allen, and Anna Marie Cardona. I was shaking so bad. The duct tape 
the asphyxiation. What do you feel? Mm -hmm. Life, Ro? Mm -hmm. Why? Because we're not dying, we're living. Do you ever think I might be executed? No. You can't have that mentality. Do you call it death row? No, we call it life row. That means you've accepted you've already this. Di you've already died. Yeah, you You're cannot already have that mentality. Carr also became the first woman to be sentenced to her end in Marion County since the 1992 sentencing of Eileen Wernos. Resentencing. Once the youngest woman sentenced to such a serious punishment, Carr's fate would change after an evidentiary hearing on May 19, 2017, in which the state declined to seek a new fatal penalty phase according to court records, and 5th Judicial Circuit Court Judge Willard Pope resentenced Carr, 32 years old at the time, to life in prison without parole. She had been fighting her sentence since 2011. As we said in her trial, the jury voted 7-5 to five to recommend the capital punishment for Carr. Carr appealed her sentence, raising several issues, including possible errors by the trial judge and the proportionality of the fatal sentence. In 2015, the Florida Supreme Court affirmed Carr's fatal sentence. The High Court wrote the following in its decision. This case involves a love triangle between the victim, Heather Strong, her estranged husband, Joshua Fulham, and the defendant, Amelia Carr, that ended when Carr and Fulham carried out their plan to slaughter Strong. Carr restarted the appeal process, claiming ineffective assistance from her lawyer. And the day that the trial began, that if I would have taken a plea, I would have avoided the death penalty. Yes. I was told prior to trial, that's just, no, that's not right. That's foolish. Because I wasn't going to, I didn't accept the plea because I wasn't going to sign my life away for something I didn't do. It was during an evidentiary hearing on this appeal that her fate changed. Carr's resentencing came at a pivotal time for Florida's fatal penalty. After being ruled unconstitutional by the U.S. Supreme Court in January 2016, Florida's capital punishment scheme became a topic of debate and revision. The Florida Supreme Court released an opinion in October 2016 calling for a unanimous jury. In March 2017, Governor Rick Scott signed new rules requiring a unanimous jury decision for the fatal sentence. The Florida Supreme Court was still hammering out final jury instructions for the new fatal sentence scheme when Carr appealed her sentence. Everyone in prison will tell you they're innocent. They were framed or they had a confession beat out of them by law enforcement. Either they were at the wrong place at the wrong time, while the person who actually committed the crime got a life sentence. I'm actually one of those people. I am sitting on death row for nothing more than a series of lies. Unique in that historical sense, in other ways, the Francis Newton case was painfully unexceptional for there was no incontrovertible evidence against Newton, and the paltry evidence that does exist had been completely compromised. Moreover, her story is one more in the long line of Texas Roe cases in which the prosecutions were sloppy or dishonest, the defenses incompetent or negligent, and the constitutional guarantee of a fair trial was honored only in name. The Crime In the months before the slayings, Francis and Adrian Newton were having marital problems. They were each involved in extramarital relationships. Of course, he was upset about that, and I wanted him to be because I wanted him to feel what I had felt with a guy that I'd gone to school with. And one of the things that I had done is said, cut that relationship off. Adrian hadn't been faithful in a marriage uh, for several, several times. And um, I had, unfortunately, I had started a relationship and, and he said that he would quit doing, you know, quit, you know, and when I say that I wanted to fix it, that's what, so one of the things that I was going to fix is I wasn't going to do that anymore. On my part, after so many times, I thought, okay, well, I'm going to do this and let him see how it feels, you know, and I did, and that wasn't a good thing on my part. Running around, he would quit doing drugs and he would quit doing illegal activity and Adrian was using drugs. In an August 30 Gatesville prison interview, Newton told me that in addition to smoking marijuana, Adrian had developed a cocaine habit. She said, he had told me he was using cocaine, but I'd never seen that, but I saw the effects of it. He was home later, he was irritable, less responsible. But she and Adrian had been together since she was a girl, and she was determined to work things out. That was on her mind on the afternoon of April 7, 1987, when she and Adrian sat down and talked. Adrian insisted that he wasn't using any more, so when they were done talking and Adrian went into the living room to watch TV, 
Quietly, she opened the cabinet where he kept his stash. That's where she found a gun. I confirmed that he, he's telling me the truth about the drugs. And so I looked in the cabinet where he normally kept drugs. There was this gun there. You know, I had heard Adrian and his brother talking earlier that day. And Adrian had told me he had was quit using drugs. And so I looked in the cabinet, and I'm just trying. And they had mentioned something about some trouble. And it was unfamiliar to me. Newton said she immediately recalled a conversation she'd heard earlier that day between Adrian and his brother, Sterling, who'd been saying with the family. I couldn't hear real close, but it sounded like they'd been in some trouble, she said. I thought I'd better take the gun out of there because I didn't want it to be in the house. I didn't want him to get into any trouble. She removed the gun, placed it in a duffel bag, and took it with her when she left the apartment around 6 p.m. to run some errands, she says. Newton says it was the last time she saw her family alive. At 7 p.m. after a couple of errands, Newton arrived at her cousin Sandra Nelm's house, where the two chatted and decided to return to Newton's apartment. As Newton backed out of the drive, she saw the duffel on the back seat and realized she needed to hide it. With Nelms watching, Newton retrieved the bag and walked next door into a burned and abandoned house owned by her parents, and there she left the bag. The women arrived at the apartment around 8 p.m. and didn't immediately realize that anything was wrong. Newton thought Adrian was napping until she saw the blood. As Francis walked around the couch and saw his upper torso, she immediately screamed and bolted to the children's bedroom. Francis began to frantically scream uncontrollably. Newton says she was shocked and dazed, but gave police as much information as possible, including the fact that she'd just removed a gun from the house. She told police about Adrian's drug habit and that he owed some money to a dealer, which Adrian's brother Terence corroborated telling police he knew where the dealer lived. Police never pursued the lead. A bullet remained lodged in Adrian's head, meaning that the blood and brain matter would have been blown back onto the gun and shooter, confirmed by a trail of blood found in the hallway. Police found no trace of gunshot residue on Newton's hands, nor on the long sleeves of the sweater she was wearing. They collected the clothing she'd worn that day. There was no blood nor any trace of blood on any of the items. I don't feel guilt in the sense that if I had done something differently, that it could have been prevented. I don't feel that type of guilt. I, sometimes I feel that I could have said something earlier about, about the things that Adrian was doing, and maybe earlier it could have been prevented, or maybe not even agreed with it at first. I asked myself, what could I have done differently? Problems with the trial. As in many Texas capital cases, a large part of the problem with Newton's appeals is that her court-appointed trial attorney, Ron Mock, never actually investigated her case. If he had, perhaps he would have followed up on the drug dealer lead or Freeze's reported comments about a second gun. Newton and her parents implored the trial judge to allow her to change attorneys, and Mock admitted to the judge that he hadn't talked to any prosecution witnesses, nor had he subpoenaed any defense witness. The judge granted the motion to remove Mock, but he declined a continuance leaving Newton little choice but to go on trial with Mock. It is interesting to know Mock has since been brought before the state bar's disciplinary board at least five times on various charges of professional misconduct, for which he has been fined and sometimes suspended. He is currently suspended from practicing law until late 2007. As Harris County prosecutors tell the story, Newton was a cold-blooded slayer who slaughtered her husband and two young children inside the family's apartment outside Houston on April 7, 1987, by shooting each of them in order to collect life insurance. Newton had the opportunity, they argued, during her 1988 trial and a motive, a troubled relationship with her husband, Adrian, and the promise of $100,000 in insurance money from policies she'd recently taken out on his life and on the life of their 21-month-old daughter, Farah. And she had the means, they say, a 25 caliber Raven Arms pistol she had allegedly stolen from a boyfriend's house. To the state, it is a simple open and shut case, which requires no further review. Her case has been reviewed by every possible court, Harris County Assistant District Attorney Roe Wilson told the Los Angeles Times in November. She exterminated her two children and her husband. There is very, very strong evidence of that. Yet despite Wilson's insistence, Newton's case isn't simple at all, and such evidence as there is, is far from strong. The state's theory is simple, and it is superficially compelling, attorney David Dow, 
head of the Texas Innocence Network at the University of Houston Law Center, argued in Newton's clemency petition. As we will see, however, appearances can be misleading. From the beginning, Frances Newton maintained her innocence. She has also offered a plausible alternative theory of the crime, a theory that neither police, prosecutors, nor Newton's own trial attorney, the infamous and suspended Ronald Mock, ever investigated. Newton and her defenders contend that Adrian, Farah, and seven-year-old Alton were likely destroyed by someone connected to a drug dealer to whom Adrian owed $1,500. The alternative theory has much to say for it. Among other things, it explains the lack of physical evidence connecting Newton to the slayings. Lingering questions about the physical evidence against Newton prompted the Texas Board of Pardons and Paroles to recommend, and Governor Rick Perry to grant, a 120-day reprieve for Newton on December 1, 2004, the day she was last scheduled for her punishment. Although Perry said he saw no evidence of innocence, legally an oxymoron, he granted the four-month stay to allow for retesting of evidence contested by Newton's defense, including nitrite residue on the hem of her skirt and gun ballistics evidence. But testing on the skirt proved impossible because the 1987 tests had destroyed the nitrite particles and Harris County court officials had stored the skirt by sealing it inside a bag together with items of the victim's bloody clothing, thereby rendering it worthless as evidence. The second round of ballistics testing, on the other hand, supposedly confirmed a match between the gun prosecutors say Newton used and the bullets that destroyed her family. However, that match may be fundamentally undermined because there is no certain connection between the gun and Newton. According to Dow, it appears that police actually recovered at least two and perhaps three 25 caliber Raven Arms pistols during their investigation of the slayings, conflicting evidence to Newton's defense. Dow argues that it is virtually impossible to know whether prosecutors have been truthful in claiming that the gun that Newton admits to hiding on April 7, 1987 was the slaying weapon. Dow asked the following questions in a supplemental petition filed with the BPP on August 25. How many records have been withheld from Newton's attorneys throughout this case? How many firearms were recovered and investigated in this case, and who owned them? However, in the end, the fact that a forensics expert for the state established that nitrites were present on the skirt Newton wore on the day of the shootings played against her. In the expert's opinion, the nitrites came from gunpowder residue and were consistent with someone shooting a pistol in the lower front area of the skirt. Less than a month prior to the slayings, Newton purchased a $50,000 life insurance policy for herself, another for her husband, and a third for her daughter. Newton, the primary beneficiary of the latter two policies, made claims on the policies following the slayings. She was sentenced to her end. Final Punishment The punishment was carried out as scheduled on September 14, 2005 by lethal injection. Newton struggled and thrashed, knocking out one of the nurses. Frances Newton was the third woman punished with capital punishment in Texas since the resumption of capital punishment in the state in 1982. The first and second were Carla Faye Tucker and Betty Lou Beats, respectively. Like Beats before her, Newton made no final statement and did not have a last meal request. Over 30 protesters from the Texas Penalty Abolition Movement, the National Black United Front, and the New Black Panther Party had gathered outside the prison. In addition, about 75 people protested the punishment outside the governor's mansion in Austin. According to the results of a Public Information Act request submitted by Texas Moratorium Network to the office of Governor Rick Perry, 12,201 people contacted the governor asking him to stop Newton's punishment, and 10 people contacted him in support of her punishment. During the investigation of Francis Newton, the forensic crime lab in the Houston Police Department was also experiencing intense criticism for the handling of evidence. Michael R. Bromwich, a former U.S. Justice Department official, said the Houston Police Department and city officials failed to provide the crime lab with adequate resources to meet growing demands for at least 15 years before the exposure of problems in its DNA division. Mum of six Lisa Cunningham could become the first Australian woman on the row in the U.S. if she is found guilty of her stepdaughter Santa's demise. Cunningham, 48 years old, has been behind bars in Arizona since she and her husband, Germaine, were arrested over the six-year-old demise in 2017. 
They are both charged with one count of first-degree slaying and several counts of child maltreatment. They pleaded not guilty. If the couple is convicted, prosecutors have indicated they will apply for the capital punishment, something Australia strongly opposes. Capital Punishment in Australia Capital punishment is a contentious issue that has been debated in many countries, including Australia. However, this fatal penalty is not currently implemented in Australia and has been abolished in all Australian states and territories. The last fatal punishment in Australia was in 1967, and in 1973, the federal government abolished the penalty for federal crimes. This was followed by the abolition of the penalty in all Australian states and territories over the following years. One of the main reasons for the abolition of the penalty in Australia was the belief that it was inhumane and ineffective form of punishment. There were also concerns that the penalty could be applied unfairly and that innocent people could be punished. In addition, many argued that there was no evidence to support the claim that the penalty acted as a deterrent to crime. In Australia, the debate about the penalty continues to be a topic of discussion. While there are some who believe that the penalty should be reintroduced, the majority of Australians are against capital punishment. One of the main arguments against the penalty is that it is irreversible and there is always a risk of punishing an innocent person. In addition, there is evidence to suggest that the penalty is not an effective deterrent to crime. Many argue that there are more effective ways to reduce crime, such as addressing the root causes of criminal behavior, improving education, and providing support for those who are at risk of offending. Another argument against the penalty is that it is often applied unfairly, with certain groups more likely to receive the penalty than others. There is evidence to suggest that people from minority groups, such as Indigenous Australians, are more likely to be sentenced to their ends. This has led people to argue that the penalty is not only inhumane, but also discriminatory. While the debate about the penalty will likely continue, it seems unlikely that it will be reintroduced in Australia in the foreseeable future. Ronald Joseph Ryan was the last person to be punished by capital punishment in Australia. He was convicted of shooting and slaying a prison officer during a prison escape in 1965. Well, I don't think Ryan shot at all. You don't think he fired a no, shot? Not at all. And I go through there. And he said, well, take a look at him. What do you think? We, we were just going to have to do it. It looks feasible. You know, it could be done. Then George Hodgson's materialised wherever he came from. We certainly couldn't thumb a lift over to Brazil. Then I looked up at the bloke in the tower's aiming at me, and we did rob one. So that meant that there would have to have been something wrong with the gun. It was jammed or something. You say to yourself, this is it, I'm gone. Well, I must admit, we were going to rob banks. Ryan has been sentenced to life imprisonment for armed robbery, but he and another inmate, Peter John Walker, had planned and managed a daring escape from Pentridge Prison in Melbourne, Victoria. During the escape, Ryan and Walker climbed a makeshift rope ladder over the prison wall. As they made their way to the waiting car, they were confronted by several prison officers. Ryan allegedly fired two shots, one of which hit and destroyed Officer George Hodson. Ryan and Walker were eventually captured and brought to trial for the slaying of Hodson. Yeah, why not? You know, what did you have to lose? 12 years was a long time for a, you know, a 22, 23-year-old bloke. 13 eyewitnesses all testify that, you know, Ryan caused the fired the shot. Police say that the two escapees are violent criminals made doubly dangerous by desperation. And I looked up and all I could see was this guard standing on top of a tower and I said to him, she's a bit bloody rude. Well, it's very hard to put it in words, you know, it's it's just actions in split seconds that are going off one after the other. A terrible situation for him to be in. When someone's got a rifle pointing at you, uh, is he going to pull the trigger or is he not? See, the whole thing is that he'd been fooling around with the gun on the road because he left an, a live round of ammunition on the road. Actually, we were sitting in the yard and Ronnie pointed up at the tower and he said, what do you think about going through there? It was, there's no way of getting around that. And over the, a few weeks, looking at it. Ryan maintained his innocence throughout his trial and subsequent appeals. He argued that he did not shoot Hodson and that the prosecution's case was based on circumstantial evidence. However, he was ultimately found guilty and sentenced to his end. Ryan's case sparked significant public debate about capital punishment in Australia. Many argued that it was a barbaric and inhumane form of punishment and that Ryan's passing would not bring Hodson back or deter others from committing similar crimes. Others believed that this penalty was necessary to deter violent criminals and protect society. And interestingly, 
The last woman to be fatally punished in Australia was Jean Lee, which was in 1950, 15 years before Ryan. She was an Australian slayer who, together with her lover Robert Clayton and accomplice Norman Andrews, was convicted for the 1949 slaying of William Pop Kent, an SP bookmaker from the Melbourne suburb of Carlton. The victim was bound to a chair, tortured with the aim of finding hidden money, and finally gagged. All three were convicted and sentenced to her end in March 1950. They were hanged 11 months later at Pentridge Gale. Now the next Australian woman to suffer the capital punishment might just be Lisa Cunningham. She would be the first Australian woman ever to be fatally punished in the U.S. Australian consular assistance is being provided to Miss Cunningham, and the Australian government has voiced its opposition to the penalty. Lisa Cunningham's Situation Lisa Cunningham, who is a former prison guard, spoke from the maximum security wing of the Estrella Women's Jail, located in the desert near Phoenix. She said the trial delay was causing her torment, but the judge explained there was no choice because the COVID pandemic had created a backlog of cases. The 48-year-old, who was born and raised in Adelaide, has been waiting for her day in court since her arrest. Cunningham was recently delivered another blow. She learned her trial will be delayed further until September 2024. Cunningham told Seven Sunday Night in 2018, It doesn't feel real. It feels shocking. I'm devastated for my family. She now has to remain behind bars at the Estrella Women's Jail, charged over a crime she says never occurred. Did you do anything wrong? Absolutely not. And the fingers are all pointing in a particular direction. I'm not going to bet my client's life. So you're saying that, the, that this was a mistake? That's correct. That child should not be dead. Something in the room stinks. There is something else you could have done. Lisa's not a criminal. She's a mother. She's a good mother. One of the worst cases of miscarriage of justice that I have experienced in my practice. To save this child's life. This is one of the worst cases of miscarriage of justice that I have ever experienced in my practice. Lisa's not a criminal. She's a mother, Cunningham's lawyer Eric Kessler said. Sierra Anderson, Lisa Cunningham's eldest child, agrees. In an interview, she said, she wanted to have her children live the life that she dreamed of as a kid. Santa's Demise Santa Cunningham, Jermaine's biological daughter, passed away in February 2017. In the months leading up to her demise, after she'd turned six, the family noticed changes in her behavior. We watched her change from a perfectly normal, vibrant six-year-old. She would forgot how to do basic tasks, like turn a doorknob or open a water bottle, Cunningham said. The family couldn't understand what was happening to their little girl. In July 2016, Santa was diagnosed with acute schizophrenia. Childhood schizophrenia is a severe mental health disorder in children younger than age 13 that affects the way they deal with reality. It involves a range of cognitive, emotional, and behavioral problems that impair a child's ability to function. The disorder is rare. Less than 1% of children are diagnosed with it and may be hard to spot. There's no cure, but treatment can help. Unfortunately, Santa never got to experience any treatment. Her parents said she had been tearing at her skin and hearing voices urging her to butcher people. She would urinate and defecate on the floor inside the house and gauge at her eyes. Child safety authorities visited the Cunningham household twice. Cunningham said they watched Santa decline and knew of her condition. In the last few months of 2016, Santa's behavior rapidly deteriorated. Cunningham said, we were jumping up and down saying something's wrong. Her quality of life is changing. Her behavior is changing. Her personality is changing. They gave us things to sedate her with so that the effects were not known. I was irrational and I was hysterical with these people because you can't give me a bottle of pills and tell me to take my six-year-old home so she sleeps for 20 hours a day. Nobody would help us. Investigation ensues. By early 2017, the six-year-old's condition was not improving and she had cuts and sores that wouldn't heal, Cunningham said. In January of that year, a psychiatrist prescribed Santa an adult antipsychotic medicine called Risperdal, of which pneumonia is a side effect. On February 10, Santa began having flu-like symptoms which lasted for at least a day. In the early morning of February 12, Cunningham discovered Santa unconscious in her bed and she was rushed to the hospital. Five hours later, Santa was gone. Her cause of demise was ruled as sepsis, poisoning of the blood, possibly the result of her wounds or acute bronchitis. We had to bury her because nobody took it seriously, Cunningham said. 
Initially, authorities didn't suspect anything untoward had occurred. But months later, police took a closer look and charged Cunningham and her husband with Santa's passing. Police allege the Cunninghams neglected and mistreated Santa, forcibly restraining her with zip ties and handcuffs. Our family's been destroyed, Sierra said. Cunningham is set to face a pretrial hearing soon. The Australian Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade is providing consular assistance to the 48-year-old. For privacy reasons, we are unable to provide further details, a spokesperson said. Cunningham continues to argue she is the victim of a miscarriage of justice and has been set up by authorities so they could avoid a costly civil lawsuit over the girl's demise. She says Santa passed from pneumonia because the couple followed flawed medical advice. The prosecution alleges the couple restrained Santa by tying her down so she couldn't expel fluid from her lungs, leading to her demise. Police allege they found incriminating texts between the couple, including one from December 2016, describing how the girl was zip-tied to a water container to let other children sleep. Cunningham claimed the texts were forged and were not on her phone on the day Santa perished months later. That's all for today's video. We'll see you next time.